Diane grew up in the same town, London, Ohio, which was a very rural, small town in the middle of Ohio. They were high school sweethearts, and after high school, they would end up getting married. Fast forward six years, and Keith and Diane have been married for six years. They have a daughter named Raven, who's four years old, and Diane has just found this beautiful new home in London, Ohio, so same place they grew up, that was a little more isolated than any other properties they were looking at. It was still within London, Ohio, but it was it was in the forest. It was way off the beaten path, so to speak. But, you know, Keith was a hunter and he loved the forest and, you know, Diane loved the forest too. So they liked the idea of having that privacy and, and kind of living away from other people. So very quickly, they decide to buy the house and they move in and they kind of settle into their, their new routine. At this time, Keith was not only working full time during the day as a welder, but at night he was taking night classes to prepare for this apprenticeship program he was trying to get into. Keith is gone five days a week for 12 hours at a stretch, leaving Diane uh, home alone with Raven when she wasn't at school. And Diane was a stay-at-home mom, so she was, she was at this house a lot. So in those first couple of weeks that they had moved into this house and Diane's getting used to being alone quite a bit, Diane at night would hear what sounded like something she described as scampering. Some animal is moving around outside of the house. And from time to time, she'd poke her head out. You know, she had this big window that sat over her the kitchen sink. So whenever she was doing dishes, she'd be looking directly into their forest in their backyard and she'd poke her head out and she'd try to get a glimpse of whatever it was. She just assumed it was, you know, a deer or a dog or something like that. It wasn't a cause for concern. It was just something she noticed within those first couple of weeks. One night after she had put Raven to bed and Keith was still out at night school, Diane was cleaning up the downstairs and she was doing the dishes and she was looking out the window and she starts hearing that scampering sound. And as she's looking, you know, she's she's got light behind her from inside the house causing kind of a glare on the glass. So she's up close to the pane of glass kind of peering out to try to catch a glimpse of this deer or dog or whatever it was. And as she's looking out into the tree line, which is very close to her house, there's only a separation of maybe 20 or 25 feet from the edge of her house to the edge of the forest. And as she's looking, she swears she sees a set of eyes looking back at her. And to her, it immediately confirms that that's a dog. There's a dog that's gotten loose and that's what's been roaming around my property. She's not frightened. She's used to being out near the woods. So she's just like, okay, cool, it's a dog. And so she finishes the dishes and she goes into the living room, which is on the other side of the house. And as she's picking up toys and moving things around, she happens to look up towards the window in their living room that's looking basically in the other direction as that window above her sink. She's looking in the opposite direction. And to her horror, there is a set of eyes that are at human level that are right up against the glass. She only sees it for a second. She sees the reflection of the eyes before she backs away startled. But there's light on in the room she's in, so she doesn't have a great view of what's outside. And she's not even sure if she actually saw those eyes. She's not sure if she's scaring herself. So she goes back into the kitchen to look out that window and see if she can see those eyes that she had seen before that she believed belonged to a dog. She was hoping that they would be gone and that that would kind of account for the eyes she just saw at the living room window, even though it would have been a very tall dog. She goes into the kitchen, she starts leaning towards the window, and then right as she's about to put her head almost against the glass, a head comes right in front of her on the opposite side of the glass with these glowing gold eyes looking right at her. She's horrified. She practically falls over and she's looking up from the ground and there's this face looking in the window directly at her. And she's scampering back like on the ground, getting out of the kitchen. And right at that moment, she hears car tires out on the driveway and it's Keith. Oh my God, Keith's gonna run into somebody that's outside. She hears the door open and she's praying it's Keith and sure enough, he calls out and he sees her on the ground in the living room and he's like, what's going on? And so she immediately tells him she definitely saw somebody outside. She thought it was a dog, maybe it wasn't. And Keith, he, he, he's a hunter, you know, he knows they're out in the woods. They've just moved into this house. He's thinking maybe, maybe my wife is actually a little bit scared to be so isolated out here. Keith goes outside with a flashlight. He's, he's looking all around. He's walking the property. He can't find tracks. He, he, he can't see anything. And so he comes back inside and he never really believed that it was anything other than maybe her imagination or just some random animal outside. And so he's just telling her like, hey, I know we just moved in. I'm sure you're stressed. You're here alone all the time. 
you know, you got this huge woods right next to our house, you're gonna hear animals. I just wouldn't sweat it. It's, it's probably nothing to worry about. She was not cool with being, you know, told don't worry about it because she knows what she saw. So a month goes by and Keith and Diane have stopped talking about whatever Diane saw. You know, there wasn't anything else happening at the house. She wasn't seeing eyes or, or animals, hearing any scampering sounds. It was just kind of back to normal. Keith is gone. He's going to night school and Diane's home by herself and she's in the kitchen. She's looking out that window. She doesn't hear any scampering or anything. And without any warning, she sees a set of eyes suddenly appear on the edge of the window just outside of the woods. She sees the eyes dead on and she backs up from the window. She's thinking to herself, I have to protect Raven. And her first thought is turn off all the lights in the house. That way it can't see me. And so she runs around the house terrified, but knew she had to do it, turning off every light. The last light she turns off is the living room light, and she's up against the wall, and as she hits the light in the living room, making everything dark, she suddenly gets a clear picture out that living room window where she had seen the eyes as well uh, the month earlier. And standing pressed against the glass is an, is an absolute human figure with eyes at human level, these orange glowing eyes at eye level, standing right against her window, looking in the window directly at her. Horrified, she starts making her way into the kitchen by sliding up against the wall. They have a landline phone that was hung in the kitchen. And so she gets to the phone, trying to keep an eye on that back window. She can see the side of this thing's silhouette. She calls 911 and says, there's someone outside my house, they won't go away. As soon as she hangs up, from her perspective, she can only see its shoulder. She watched the shoulder disappear out of her view. She poked her head back in the living room and sure enough, it's gone. And as she's sitting there, it's silent. There's no sound in the house. She can hear clear scampering sounds, like running sounds outside of her house as this thing is running all the way around her house. And she's sitting there wondering if this thing's gonna break a window to come inside, what would she even do? And so finally she sees the flashing lights of a cop car pulling into the driveway and she hears the police knock at the door. She runs to the door, opens it up, and she's hysterical. And the police are trying to calm her down to just get the story of what's going on. And she's pointing out, you know, saying there's something out there. And the police start looking around the property. Keith comes home and he knows instinctively what's probably happened because the police are scanning the property for something. And he's thinking she saw this thing again, you know, whatever it is, it probably was just a reflection of herself in the glass. And now she's called the police. You know, this is a small town. Keith is worried that people are going to think he's crazy. And so it, it, he comes in and he regretted this, but he immediately got mad at his wife. Like, what are you doing? You know, like you're calling the cops. Like there's nothing here. I looked last time they're looking now. And they were even saying like, we haven't seen anything. We're gonna look for a little bit longer, but there's no sign of anybody being here. And at some point the police are like, yep, we didn't find anything. And the police are like, you know, let us know if anything else happens and they leave. Keith and Diane are left just fighting. So four months go by without incident. There's no scampering outside. There's no eyes in the windows. And Keith and Diane have kind of moved past that whole ordeal and they're, you know, back to normal. They're really not even thinking about it. And even Diane would say, like, I did begin to believe that it was just in my imagination and that I was just stressed and maybe overwhelmed at how often I was alone in that house and it was just getting to me. And, you know, four months go by. It's, it's, it's early December of 1981 and it was the first big snowfall of the winter. And Keith wakes up one morning after the snowfall, you know, a few inches on the ground, and he decides, because his family's still sleeping, that he's going to go out and he's going to get donuts and bring them back for the family, donuts and coffee. So it's still dark outside. He goes outside, starts up his car. You know, he's rubbing his eyes. He's still tired. And he's adjusting his rear view mirror. And when he stops it for a second and he's looking up there, he thinks he sees somebody standing behind his car. What? And he like readjusts it and he looks and it's gone. And so he throws the car in park, grabs his flashlight, and he starts looking around because he knows he just saw someone standing behind his car. And so he's walking around shining his light and he's realizing the irony of this situation. This is the same situation that his wife was in, believing she saw somebody outside their house, looking for it, it's nowhere to be found. He just saw someone standing, saw the eyes of a person, you know, standing behind his vehicle, can't find this person. And he's thinking, you know, was there any truth in what she saw? Was I wrong? And so he's looking everywhere and all of a sudden he sees tracks. He can't tell what kind of tracks they are, but there's clear prints in the snow. It's fresh snow. He knows where he had been walking and he starts following them, thinking he's gonna get to either a person or he doesn't know what. And he sees they stop right next to his house. 
and he's looking like, where could they have gone? And then he looks up to the, there was a first floor section of the house that was a little bit extended. So there was a roof that was at the first floor level. And then there was the rest of the house that was at the second floor level. And he sees that the footsteps go from the ground to the first floor roof. And then they go up to the second floor roof and they go over to the other side of the house. Who's doing this? What's doing this? And so he starts going to the other side of the house and he can't see any more prints. And he's looking up at the top of his house and he's thinking, am I going crazy? Something's on my house. Like what's going on? And so he goes inside and he calls his hunting buddy, Dennis, who's the only person that lives relatively close to them. And he's like, you've got to come over here right now. I got something weird going on. I think someone's stalking my house. I can't be sure you've got to come over here. Dennis is like, I'll be there in a minute. When Dennis gets there, Keith's outside with his rifle. And Dennis is like, what are you doing? And he's like, somebody, and he shows him the prints, jumped on my roof. Someone's on my roof. I don't know what's going on, but someone I think is on my roof. And as they're talking about it, they hear what sounds like thump. Something just landed really hard from a pretty high distance. And it was on the other side of the house. They kind of run around, you know, rifle, and Dennis had his rifle too. They go to the other side, and they see like two clear footprints but 20 feet away from the edge of the house. Meaning this thing on the roof, if it jumped off, it jumped not only two stories to the ground, but it jumped 20 feet out away from the house as well because there was no other footprints. And they just heard it land and it ran off into the forest. And so Dennis and Keith look at each other and Dennis is like, what do you want to do? And Keith's like, let's go after it. Now, Dennis and Keith, they hunt in these woods all the time. And they see right away that the footprints, the, the tracks of this, this person or creature or whatever it is, they're about 14 inches long and it appears to be a bipedal creature. It does not appear to be on four legs. Something's moving on two legs. And they're thinking about just how would this person be able to get on the roof? What animal runs around that has a 14 inch track? that runs on two legs. Like they're not really sure what to make of it. Is it a person? Is it a creature? We don't know. And so they follow the tracks into the woods and the whole time they have this awful sensation that something's watching them. And from time to time, they would hear something a ways away from them that sounded like a big animal moving in the forest, but they could never quite get to it in time. And at some point they started hearing noises behind them. And they're thinking like, is it possible that this thing is has run ahead of us and then looped back around and is now tracking us? Like they were feeling really uncomfortable. And as they're about to just kind of abandon this search, because they've been looking for this thing for hours, they keep following its tracks, they get to a clearing and they find this tiny cabin that neither of them had seen before right in the middle of the clearing. And they see that these tracks lead right up to it and they follow the tracks up to the, up to the cabin and the tracks stop right outside the door. There's one door leading into this cabin and the door is shut. And they're thinking like, what animal can open and shut doors? And so Dennis starts immediately hitting on the door, trying to get this person to come outside and show themselves. We know you were over at Keith's property. Get out here. We followed you here. We know it's you. There's no sound inside. There's no movement inside. They're looking in the windows. There's nothing. Keith realizes like it's a bad look for us to have tracked this person to their house. We have guns. Like this is a bad look for us. We, we can't be here. We need to leave and, and just let this go. They have a couple more choice words and then they leave. And they decide instead of going back through the woods, they go to the nearest road that they could hear nearby. They go to the road uh, and they go to a payphone. They call Keith's father who comes to pick them up. And when they hop in the car, Keith's dad is like, why do you have guns? And Keith and Dennis explain what happened. And they describe this cabin in the woods that they were just at. And Keith's dad is like, oh, I know who lives in that cabin. It's this guy who works at the at the tire shop. He's a, he's a loner type guy, older guy. Uh, no one really knows much about him. So Dennis is like, we got to go to that tire shop. I want to get a look at this guy. Keith's a little bit unsure. Like he doesn't want to blow this out of proportion, but they ultimately decide that they're going to bring a beat up tire to this tire shop and ask to get it repaired to try to get a look at this person who apparently owns the cabin. So they go to this tire shop. They know that the front desk attendant is not the guy who owns the cabin. It's the actual mechanic who's in back. And so they give the tire over and the front desk guy yells back to George. Says, hey, George, come out here, you got a tire. And so Keith would describe George coming out of the shadows to get the tire. And he's like the six foot five older guy who looks up at Keith and Dennis. And he's got these orange eyes. Keith would say it was the most distinctive set of eyes he'd ever seen. And he looks up at them and George has a moment of recognition that he's looking at the two men that just tracked him to his house. And Dennis and Keith are looking at him thinking, 
we know it was you. And they both recognize it. George looks down, walks away with the tire. And then when he finishes whatever he's doing with the tire, he rolls it out to the middle of the floor to stay in the shadows. Keith and Dennis are like, he didn't want to show himself again. He knows that we know he's the guy. Dennis and Keith leave and think, man, like that's so weird. He's an old guy. I mean, he kind of fits the description, I guess. You know, he's a big guy, 14 inch tracks. That could be him. But none of it really, really added up. I mean, he's an older guy. How's he getting on the roof? Keith is like, I can't tell police what happened because I would have to admit that I stalked him to his house with a gun. That's how I know he's there. And he didn't commit a crime. At least I can't pin him to a crime. And so he can't tell the police. He doesn't want to tell his wife because his wife not only would have a big told you so moment, he knew that she would, she would immediately want to leave, like move. And he did not have the financial resources to move. And so he decides to just kind of keep it to himself and hope that he does not run into George again. So for a few months, there's no sightings of anything strange happening at their house, at Keith and, and Diane's house. But in March of 1982, three months after their encounter with George at the tire shop, Dennis shows up at Keith's house. And he says, hey, get in, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna show you something. And so Keith gets in Dennis's car and they start driving and Keith can tell that Dennis is taking him towards this cabin in the woods where George lives. And Keith says to Dennis, we can't do this. We, we, we cannot go to this guy's house. We know he did it, but what are we gonna do? And Dennis goes, no, I just found out that George died. He's dead. So we can just go check it out right now and go check out his residence. And Keith is like, I feel bad about it, but okay, let's go check it out. And so they start driving down this one access road that would lead to George's cabin and they find a cop car is sitting in the middle of the road. It would turn out that Dennis knew the cop and he explained the whole strangeness behind this cabin and how it related to them. And the cop at first was very reluctant to give any information about why he was there or what was going on at the cabin. But ultimately he relented and said, actually, you know, I'm here because there's some strangeness with the cabin. Uh, we don't really know what to make of it. And, you know, if you want to, I can give you a, a quick peek of, of what the cabin looks like. Keith and Dennis are like super intrigued and they're like, okay. And so they go into this cabin and there's nothing in it. There's basically a chair and a table, but that's it. There's no personal effects. There's no food. There's, there's nothing. It's just this empty, tiny space. And Keith and Dennis are, you know, shocked. They're like, wow, this guy was living like a hermit, basically. And they thought that that was what the cop was referring to when he said there's some weirdness with this cabin. They're like, man, that's crazy. You know, George, how did he live like this for 40 years? Crazy. And the cop's like, no, that's not the weird part. He goes, that's the weird part. And he points at a sheet that's hanging down inside of the cabin. The cop goes over and pulls the, the sheet aside and it revealed a metal door, a sliding door, and they slid it open and immediately they're hit with this wet dog smell, like kind of a gross wet dog smell. And they go into this, this cell that had plate steel lining the walls with metal strips and rivets holding everything in place. It was like this metal encased tomb that they were in. And in the middle of the floor was a 10 foot chain link. And at the end there were shackles for wrists and for feet. And on the wall were all these scratch marks, old and new, all over the walls. And so the police officer's like, yeah, we're trying to figure out what old George was doing with this cell in his cabin in the middle of the woods. Keith and Dennis, they leave and they go back into their car and they're driving away and neither of them are even talking about what they saw. But they know that something that was being held in that cage in the cabin had been the thing they had stalked. It had been the thing that had been stalking their property, Keith's property. It was the thing that was staring in the windows. It's all very unsettling. But Keith, Dennis, Diane never found out what it was. Keith would say, though, that there was no more stalking at his property once George had died. They never saw the eyes again. So no matter what this was, Something was showing up at Keith and Diane's house and looking in the windows and, you know, stalking them. And something made tracks, got on the roof of Keith and Diane's house, ran into the woods and made its way back to George's cabin. Now, we don't know if that something was just George or if it was some creature 
some animal that was in that cage or if it was something else. So let me know in the comments what you think it was and what happened and I'll do my best to get back to as many people as I can. If you enjoyed this story, I would ask you- Seven-year-old Lydia Makarchuk left her home country of Ukraine and moved to Bracknell, which is a town just outside of London. Shortly after moving into her new apartment, Lydia went out and got a job as an accountant at a local hotel. And then after that, Lydia pretty much swore off her social life and instead just focused exclusively on working hard and saving money. The one reprieve she got from work was going to church on Sundays. Two years later, Lydia was at her church enjoying the coffee hour that always followed the Sunday sermon when another member of her church, who she didn't really speak to, this 41-year-old man named Norbert Varga, approached her and kind of awkwardly complimented her shoes. And she was so flattered by this that it opened up a friendly conversation between the two of them. And during this conversation, Lydia was pleasantly surprised to find out out that Norbert was an expat too. An expat is someone who lives outside of their native country. Norbert had moved to the UK in 2018, so that's one year after Lydia had moved to the UK, and he came from Hungary, which shares a border with Ukraine. And just like Lydia, when he got to the UK, he kind of put all his energy into his work and trying to save money. He was a radio technician and a photographer. And so the two spend the rest of this coffee hour chatting and enjoying each other's company, and then afterwards, when they left the church and they both got home, they both found themselves thinking about the other. There was clearly an attraction there. And so the following Sunday, they both very eagerly rushed back to church in order to spend more time together. And sure enough, during that coffee hour, they spent the whole time together just chatting it up. And then afterwards, they exchanged phone numbers and made plans to get together outside of church. They were going to go on a date. And so the rest, as they say, is history. Two years after Norbert complimented Lydia's shoes, they got married in Bracknell. And while the wedding was great, unfortunately, none of Lydia's family members who were all in Ukraine, none of them could attend the actual wedding. And so the newlywed couple decided the way they would handle that is their honeymoon would be spent in Ukraine. That way, Lydia's family could celebrate their wedding as well. For a variety of reasons, this honeymoon trip to Ukraine kept getting pushed back. But finally, in September of 2021, everything lined up, everyone was available. And so Norbert and Lydia rushed to the airport and they hopped on a flight. And during this flight to Ukraine, Lydia remembers being so excited specifically about her husband finally getting a chance to spend some time with her 29-year-old younger brother, Miroslav. Lydia was very close with her brother, and so it mattered to her greatly that he and her husband had a good relationship. But to that point, because of the great physical distance between the UK and Ukraine, the two had really not had that much interaction, and so they really didn't know each other very well. And so this trip was really important to Lydia. And Miroslav, he really picked up on that because he put together this camping trip for the end of their stay in Ukraine, where he knew he'd be able to step aside with Norbert and chat with him and get to know him a little bit. And so that was kind of like the fail safe, where if he and Norbert did not get a chance to speak all week because they were visiting with so many people, they would have a chance to at the end of the week on this camping trip. So after a few hours of flying, Lydia and Norbert touch down in Ukraine and they make their way to Lydia's family's house where they're going to be staying for the week. And that night and for the next several days, the couple was swamped with several family reunions and meetups with old friends that hadn't seen Lydia in years. And so Norbert and Miroslav were not getting any time to themselves. And Lydia really knew that. And so she and Norbert began looking forward to this camping trip because that not only represented a kind of peaceful break from the chaos of all these reunions, but it also did represent the one chance they knew Miroslav and Norbert would get to interact with each other. And and so finally, September 15th, the end of the week, it came and it was time to go on this camping trip. And so Lydia and Norbert and Miroslav and nine other family members, they all packed up their tents and their camping belongings and they loaded up a couple of cars and they drove over to the base of the Carpathian mountain range. This mountain range, which stretches for nearly 1,000 miles across Eastern and Central Europe, are very popular amongst tourists because it's stunningly beautiful. Everything is green and lush and there are these crystal clear lakes and breathtaking waterfalls and all these amazing animals running around and there's no mosquitoes and they have these really cool hikes that bring you up to these very impressive overlooks. And so that night, Miroslav had made reservations for this one campsite, this very popular campsite that was up in this clearing, not too far up the mountain, and it had this great view down to the forest below, and because it was in a clearing, it had this unobstructed view up to the sky where in this area, you could look up and just see stars in every direction. And so when 
when Lydia and the rest of this group arrive in the parking lot of this mountain range, they were all really excited to get up to this campsite and just enjoy being there. And so they park their cars, they get their gear out, they find the trailhead, and then they begin hiking up the mountain. And about two hours later, they arrive at this clearing. They find their campsite, which was marked by this small fire pit underneath a couple of trees. And so they go over and they set their tents up and some people go out and get some firewood. And then before long, a fire was made and this group of 12 people that had not seen each other in so long, they just sat down and began enjoying each other's company. They put tea on, they were swapping stories. It was really just this wonderful time. And then around 8 p.m., the sun started to set, at which point this huge group just stopped and enjoyed this beautiful sunset. And then once the sun had gone down, there were two kids that were there on this trip. And so they were put to bed in their tent. And then the remaining 10 adults just kind of hung out by the fire and enjoyed each other's company. And it was actually during this second half of the night that Norbert and Miroslav finally really got a chance to just chat with each other. So for about an hour, they were talking to each other and Lydia is just watching this happen and she couldn't be happier. This is like the perfect ending to this trip. And then around 9 p.m., Norbert stands up. Lydia sees him stand up and he tells the group he's going to run back to his tent, which was a ways away from the campfire, and he was going to get his camera. And so Lydia said, okay, no problem. And she remembers watching him walk off into the distance because when you're at the campfire, if you're looking away from the campfire, everything is pitch black in that direction. And so she watches him disappear into the darkness. And then she and her brother and everyone else just kind of turn back towards the campfire. And then all she remembers about what happens next is she heard a whistling sound. And at first it was very faint, but it started to get very, very loud. And when it got loud, she tried to kind of figure out where it was, but before she could, suddenly something hit her in the face, predominantly hit her in the nose. And as soon as it did, she went blind, she went deaf, and then she felt herself on the ground and she has no idea what's going on. And all she can remember thinking is, oh my God, something horrible has happened to me. I might die. I don't know what's happening, but I might die. And so she started praying for herself to survive whatever was happening to her. And then her hearing started to come back just a little bit. Her vision was still totally blurred. She could only kind of tell where the fire was because it was bright, but her hearing, it started to come back. And that's when she heard moaning coming from somewhere near her. And so she's thinking, okay, whatever horrible thing has happened to me has happened to other people too. And so instead of just praying for herself, she began praying for everyone who was at this campsite. And so as her hearing is getting louder and louder and she's hearing more and more moaning and crying happening all around her, she suddenly hears her husband screaming her name. Her vision is still gone, but she knows it's him and he lands right behind her and he grabs her and he's just repeating her name over and over and over again. And then Lydia manages to kind of choke out to her husband what happened. And there's a pause and then Norbert says to her, it's bad, it's really bad bad. It would turn out their campsite was on a battlefield from World War I, and buried underneath the soil right under their fire pit was an unexploded bomb from World War I. Meaning, for over a hundred years, countless campers have arrived at this campsite and lit fires on top of this bomb that they couldn't see. And each fire gradually eroded the outer metal casing of this explosive until finally that night in September with Lydia and 11 of her loved ones nearby, their little fire finally was it. It pushed through that last little bit of the casing and it ignited the bomb and it detonated. That whistling that she heard was the sound of the fire finally cutting through that casing and being exposed to the fire. And then that thing that struck her in the face, that hit her right on the nose, that was almost certainly a piece of the bomb itself. So shrapnel that was cutting through her face. And then the moaning she heard was primarily her brother who was right next to her. Lydia would be gravely wounded, but she would survive. As for her brother and another man who was not named, they would not survive. Here is a picture that was taken of the group literally minutes before this bomb detonated.
In 2015, I was in the military and me and my unit were sent overseas to do some training. Now, normally training for us consisted of doing things both on the land and also in the oceans. But when we got to this particular country, we were told by this country that we were not allowed to go in their waterways unless we had head to toe complete full body protection. And even then it was still pretty risky. And so naturally we said, why? And they said, because our waterways are too toxic. They are too polluted. We were skeptical because previously we had dove and been in waters that were really, really hazardous. And so the idea that some trash was going to stop us from doing any training in the water seemed far fetched. But when we got there and we walked down to the edge and looked out at the water, we were shocked. The water looked black from all the oil and pollution and amidst this black sludge were thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of plastic just bobbing on the surface in all directions. It was truly staggering. But what really amazed me was nobody was trying to fix this. There was no attempts being made to clean up this waterway. In fact, the opposite was happening because this waterway had gotten so bad people had just kind of given up on it and just continued to dump trash and pollutants into this waterway and so we would go out on our boats into this water we would not go in it but we'd be out in the water and we would look down and we would just see dead sea lions and dead birds and other dead marine animals just floating on the surface and they had all most likely died from either eating plastic or getting trapped in plastic or consuming some other toxic pollutant I I mean, literally, their homes have become a death trap because of this plastic and pollution crisis. And so a few weeks ago, when I was approached by Mr. Beast and his team to potentially help support their massive ocean cleanup that they call Team Seas, I immediately said yes. They are trying to raise $30 million by the end of this year in order to remove 30 million pounds of plastic and trash from the oceans, as well as from rivers and also from beaches. This project has the potential to truly change the planet, but we need your help. Every donation counts. I mean it. If you donate even just a single dollar to Team Seas, a full pound of trash and plastic will get removed from the ocean guaranteed. So if you want to be a part of Team Seas with me and Mr. Beast and hundreds of other content creators and YouTubers and people all around the planet, go to teamseas.org today and give what you can. Thank you. So that's going to do it, guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the like button is late for their flight, offer to give them a ride to the airport, but make sure you sneak several three and a half ounce containers of toothpaste into their luggage. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly